Welcome to our 234th weekly webcast. Now, if this is the first time you're joining us, welcome. If you've been with us before, welcome back. And so the way this call works is this is an AMA, just like you see on Reddit, ask me anything. You can ask me business questions, personal questions, career questions, investing questions, any questions you want to. And my humble goal is to help you take your company or your career to the next level. Now, I wanna do something a little bit different this morning to start off this call. I wanna talk about advertising. Now, the best companies in the world, what they do is they spend between 10 and 20% of their annual revenue on advertising. So Coca-Cola has $40 billion in annual revenue, and they spend about 10% of that, meaning $4 billion on advertising. Now, PepsiCo spends more than that. It's close to 20%, actually. And this here is a new product called Pepsi Nitro. And if you haven't tried it yet, you have to. It's kind of like it's kind of like a Guinness beer. All right, it's fun doing these things live, eh? So when you pour it, it looks like a Guinness, and you're supposed to have um, you're supposed to pour it this way. And it's it's an incredible product. It really is. It's amazing. So, how much money should you spend on advertising your business? Well, I'd say at least ten percent of your annual revenue. This thing is so good. It's got twice the caffeine. It's okay, it's early in the morning. It's a bit sweeter too. It's so good, you gotta try it. So how do you advertise? How do you spend money to advertise yourself? Well, what I recommend doing is, I don't recommend paying for ads on YouTube or on Facebook or anywhere else. I recommend spending 10% of your budget on equipment, it could be uh, 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 video equipment like I have here in this office, and it could be hiring somebody to help you create your vlogs, um, your your Instagram posts, uh, your your tweets, etc. And the best way to do it is to use Gary Vaynerchuk's methodology of repurposing content. What does that mean? Well, what you do is you create one massive amount of content, and then you break it up into pieces and distribute it in different channels. And so that's what I do with this weekly YouTube call. I've been doing this weekly call for almost five years now, wow. And what we do is we take the seven best questions asked on this call and we turn them uh, into uh, videos on Instagram, uh, LinkedIn videos, uh, also TikTok, et cetera. And, and a lot of people think that advertising is a waste of money. It's not. It's so much easier for us to understand the concept of sales though. So for me, you know, when I first started this business teaching online, I thought, oh my God, what's the point of advertising? I don't get an immediate return on investment. But if I ask somebody to buy a product right now, I might get a bit of a return. Well, the way it works is this. You have to see a commercial nine times before you buy a product. And when it comes to, to Toyota or the auto industry, you have to see a commercial close to 20 times before considering buying a product. And, average, and my wife works in marketing. She was explaining to me years ago that advertising and marketing in general is like dating. You don't get married after one date. You can't generate a sale after one date. It takes time and you have to be very, very long-term focused. You know, the longer the view, the wiser the intention. Um, so. What you have to do is you have to think about what is the lifetime value of your customer in the long run. Then what you do is you think about advertising based on that amount. So for example, if I think one of my courses can make a million dollars, then I should spend $100,000 promoting it. It's painful. And I've done that with a, a, a trailer you're gonna see. I spent much more than that coming up soon. I can't wait to show you guys. Now, don't give up. When you start making your YouTube content or your Instagram videos, whatever it is, just understand your competition's gonna give up after a couple of months, maybe a year they'll give up, who knows? You gotta stay in it for the long term. And you gotta think about adding value to people's lives, helping them with your product or your, your service. And so for me, I humbly believe that I am helping people uh, with their careers. It takes time. But I promise you, it's worth it in the long run. Yeah. And if you guys have questions about how to advertise or create your own content, uh, let me know. I don't really spend money 
uh, advertising aside from creating these videos here for you guys and this weekly call with my equipment in this office. It all makes sense, so it helps a lot. I promise you, you just got to be there for the long term. Now, what you can also do is you can repurpose your content into books. So, for example, um, I have a course coming out uh, called the Complete Artificial Intelligence Course. And I made it with uh, Luca Anison, who's one of the, according to Google, one of the top 100 machine learning and AI experts in the world. And what we're doing is we're putting it in my MBA program for free for my MBA students, of course. But what we're also doing is we're taking all the captions, the closed captions from the course, and we're exporting it into a book. And you can do the same thing as well as you build your brand and, and the brand of you. And so I've had lots of students that, that have written books uh, in, in the past. And here's just some of them here. Oops. Now, this book here was the first book that I published. And the way I did it, and the way I recommend all of you do it, and I'm going to give you a template to download uh, 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 the, the book template in a second. I'll give you a link to it. But the way you do it is this. You write one article on LinkedIn okay, every week for two years. That's what I did. And then what you do, you, you have 104 articles, which is big enough to, to create a book. And make the article short, like 600 words max per article. Then what you do is you publish your book, which, is a, which just includes those articles you published over two years on LinkedIn. And you make the ones that got the most clicks, views, likes, whatever, or comments earlier in your book. Now, if you want, what you can do is you can download a template for this book. I'm going to show you in a second. And it's crucial to do this because you need to create the brand of you, right? You got, you got to think of yourself as a thought leader, like the Rodin sculpture, I think, therefore, I am. And when you go to your interviews or meetings with potential customers, what you can do is you can give them your book. Who does that? And if you ask yourself, you tell yourself, oh, my God, Chris, that sounds like a lot of work. You got to ask yourself, how badly do you want that job? Okay, or that customer. So I'm going to show you how to download uh, this this book template, which which is free. Let me get this drink out of the way. It's so good, but it is a little bit early to be drinking. All right. So what you can do is you can go to my website, which is harunmba.com slash write book. Okay, that's all lowercase. And what you can do is you download this template here, in Microsoft Word, which is in six inches by nine inches. And on the first page of that download are instructions on how to create your book for free on three different platforms. Amazon Audible, which is acx.com, Amazon Kindle, and Amazon Print uh, as well. It costs you absolutely nothing to make these things. So the best time to start advertising is today. And I promise you, you're all going to look back years from now and say, gosh, I wish I had created more YouTube content. Because YouTube is the only gold rush in history where it costs you nothing to make the product. And YouTube is the only gold rush in history where you can get access to millions of potential customers for free. Okay. All right. Let me get to your, your questions now. All right. So late last night, uh, Vicente Correa, uh, who's one of my students, actually my MBA program, posted a bunch of questions that, that I want to go through. And uh, Vicente, actually, um, he was in my Platinum MBA program last year. And halfway through the program, he got a job offer at Goldman Sachs to work in investment banking at the MBA level. He was in the same start class as Harvard Business School graduates as well. So he posted a couple of questions last night. Uh, first one was, uh, Chris, hope you're doing well, likewise. I was wondering if you have any tips on how to put boundaries at work when having multiple demanding teams uh, pulling you uh, in many directions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the most important thing is when you first start working in a company, you have to establish boundaries. You have to let your boss or your teammates know that you have a family. And if you do this for, at the very beginning, it's easier for you to leave every now and then to go to uh, you know, parent-child events. And one of my biggest failures, and I'll never forget this, it hurts to talk about it even, is my son, Andrew. Years ago, he's older now, he's at, at Berkeley, he's in university, but when he, was, when he was really young, there was an event at school, it was called a Daddy Child Breakfast event. And I didn't go to it because I had, I had something really, really important to do at work. 
I don't remember to this day what that was. That's how important that event was. But I remember, and it hurts my heart that I missed that, that meeting with, with Andrew. And by the time your kids are 12 years old, statistically, you've already spent 90% of the time you'll ever spend with them. So if you have an event for your child at work, you have to go, especially early on in your career, meaning in the first six months of working a new job. People will get it and they'll respect you more for it. Last thing I'll say in that topic, and this is, this is hard to do, but if you can, choose to work for somebody that also has kids. Yeah. All right. Um, another thing you can do uh, to, to be more productive at work is to write a daily schedule. So I do this, and it's part of my, my MBA program too. What I do is I write a daily schedule before I go to bed every single day. And it looks like this here. So you schedule your entire day the night before. And I'm going to give you a free template uh, uh, right now uh, uh, for you to download something similar to this. But you schedule your day every day before you go to bed. And you put this by your sink. And at the end of the day, before you set your next schedule, what you do is you score yourself. And you take off 10% for every violation. It's subjective. So for example, if you didn't go to the gym, take off 10%. If you missed a meeting or didn't call your mom or dad, take off 10% and score yourself in the bottom right hand corner. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a, a template, another free template uh, for this. I don't need your email address or anything like that. I'm just going to show you. So to download this schedule, and I promise you it works because if you want to get something done, give it to a busy person. You go to harunmba.com slash all lowercase again, schedule. Okay. Let me try it again. I typed this. Oh, I spelled schedule. Guys, the older I get, the better I was. Schedule. Why does schedule have an H in it? I don't get it. Let me try that one more time. Schedule. Okay, there we go. I had a senior moment there, eh? And so what you can do is you can download a, a schedule similar to the one that I showed you. And if you, accomplish, if you write this down, your schedule every weekday, don't do it on weekends, you'll drive yourself crazy. But if you do this every single uh, uh, weekday, I promise you, you'll get more done. It's kind of like when you go on vacation and you can't get anything done, right? You don't have time to go to the gym on vacation. It's because you're, you're not busy. You want to get something done, give it to a busy person. So here's what the schedule looks like right here. And this is kind of an older one for me. But what you do, and this is in PowerPoint, also works in LibreOffice and Keynote and Google Slides. What you do is you schedule each day the day before. So you put the day here, day one and the date and see how many days in a row you can do this. And this is personal for me, but let me show you down here what you can do. And then what you do is you, you write here, everything you're gonna accomplish, including time for the gym, um, you know, going to bed early enough, that sort of thing. And what I'll do is I'll take my face off in the corner. It's like a Canadian hockey reference, eh? <laughs> so you can see what's below me here. Then at the end of the day, you score yourself down here out of 100%. Okay, now for me, uh, this is an older one, uh, but here I had just deadlines on what courses I was gonna publish and when. And up here, this is personal, you can change this if you want to. If I didn't put God first and say my prayers, I take, you know, I, put, I, I don't check that box, I take off 20%. Um, if I didn't put customers first, uh, I take off uh, a marks as well. If I spent too much time surfing the internet or going through emails, I take off time. I have to get 20,000 steps per day and more and more and more. And you can ask me about these other things here if, if you want to. And then what you do again is down here in the corner, you're gonna score yourself out of 100%. And again, it's very subjective, but I promise you, if, if you do this, you will accomplish a hell of a lot more. Okay, let me go back to big Chris mode here. Okay. Um, yeah. Another, the next question is, a friend of mine told me um, uh, he was a bit more assertive at work in terms of what he wants to do, and he seems to be enjoying work now. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to tell your boss what you want to do, but what I recommend doing is this. What I'm about to tell you will increase the chances of you, number one, getting promoted, and it'll also decrease the chances of you being let go when job cuts come. So what you do is, is this. Every three months, I want you to set up a meeting with your boss, okay? And you usually do it when your boss is in a good mood and when your boss says, hey, great job on that project, whatever it was. 
then you say, great, you have a couple minutes for, for a coffee or, or a Pepsi Nitro. And what you do is during that meeting with your boss, you first of all mention how much you enjoy being part of the team, if true. Um, and if your boss congratulates you on a big accomplishment saying, as a team, we did a great job. Then what you do is you pivot and you say this. Certain things I, I, I love doing, I love doing everything at this company. Uh, but I would love to focus a little bit more on this longer term. And, and maybe you could consider me for a promotion. And the reason I'm asking for a promotion um, or let me know at least what I need to accomplish to get promoted is because, as you know, living here in the Bay Area or wherever you live, it's expensive. And I want to provide the best quality of life for my family. And so you ask, what do I need to get promoted? What do I need to accomplish? And your boss will tell you. Then three or six months later, once you've accomplished those items, what you can do is you can ask your boss, after your boss says, great job again, and you ask for a coffee with them, you say, you know, I remember last time we spoke, uh, we talked about what I need to accomplish to get a raise or a promotion. Well, humbly, I've, I've done that, and I'd love to please ask you for a raise or a promotion. And what we don't know is that most people in companies that get promoted, and most people that are vice president level or above, have done exactly what I'm telling you they did. And they've asked multiple times for, for a raise or a promotion. Asking you'll receive, it's prophetic, it's been true since the beginning of time. If you just keep your head down at work and, and do a good job, you think you'll get noticed. Kind of like in school, you're proud of yourself for getting good grades and you kept your head down and worked hard. But then you look around at work after a year or two and you notice other people are getting promotions or raises faster than you. It's because they asked and we have to ask as well. Now let's pivot and quickly discuss what to do to decrease the chances of you being let go. So you do the exact same thing I mentioned. You sit down with your boss and maybe it's not time for you to ask for a promotion. Maybe you can ask them just for feedback. I'd love to, you know, I'm very happy to be a part of this team. We've accomplished a lot together. I'd love to ask you what else I can do to add even more value. And if you ask for feedback like that every couple of months or so, the probability of you being let go when there are job cuts goes down materially. Yeah. Okay, next question is, how can I be more confident at work uh, when I feel I do not belong? Yeah, uh, I appreciate any tips on confidence and being more assertive at work. Thank you, yeah, yeah. So you have to force yourself to socialize uh, at work. Uh, I remember for me, when I, when I first got started, I, I was a programmer uh, at Accenture, a developer. And I loved it. I would code all day long, 10, 12 hours in a row. I loved it. And I would go to parties or corporate events and I'd be kind of nervous. And it's because I was isolating myself. You got to force yourself to move to open spaces, so to speak. You got to force yourself to get involved and talk to other people and socialize. And yeah, it might feel uncomfortable at first, but after a while it'll become second nature. And in general, in business, you have to run to your fears. If you're scared of public speaking, you're fearful of it, run to it, embrace it, condition yourself to enjoy it. You know, throw down a challenge. Always challenge yourself. Yeah. Okay. Another thing I recommend uh, at work is everybody go and find at least two or three mentors, kind of like, like Yoda's. And, and I have this lightsaber here, this Yoda lightsaber, because I, I just recorded um, a, a course with Luca Anderson. <laughs> His name is Luca Anderson. Anderson is an Anakin Skywalker. But we all need Yodas in life, right? So you got to find your Yodas at work, meaning mentors. And it could be anybody in a different department that has something in common with you. Do a search on LinkedIn for people that maybe went to the same high school as you and your company or undergrad and set up meetings with them and just get to know them and just ask them for advice after a while in terms of how to get promoted, etc. Now, one of the best mentors you can have is your boss's assistant. And I say that because your boss's assistant is probably not mentoring that many people, but he or she has worked with your boss likely for many years at many different companies. And they know exactly what the blueprint is for you to get promoted or to ask your boss for something. So anyway, get lots of mentors at, at work. I promise you this works out incredibly well. All right, let me now move on to other questions. Okay, we got Alex P. From the, from the great state of Utah who wrote here, top of the morning, Chris, how are you? Um, 
how would you gauge the AI readiness of the LinkedIn platform? Uh, do you feel LinkedIn is doing enough to make sure its users are ready for AI enhancements uh, that may come about? Yeah. So be careful when you're writing articles on LinkedIn uh, using AI. And be careful in general when you use ChatGPT to write anything because the copyright laws for this have not been written yet. And you might be breaching copyright laws. We don't know. More importantly, though, uh, my son, who's at Berkeley, he told me that when he submits essays, teachers have these algorithms that will check to see if you use ChatGPT or any AI algorithm. So be really, really careful about that. And for those of you applying to universities, please don't use ChatGPT to write your entire essay. You can use it for ideas. But all this stuff can be back tested. And it's it's and you know the admissions department will have access to that for life. Now, I have my own article in Forbes magazine. And before I hit publish, a pop-up box appears that says, Did you use any AI products to write this article? And of course I select no. Just be really, really careful with this stuff. Yeah, people are going to get in a lot of trouble just for relying on it. And there's a, there's a great website called CNET. It's, it's tech journalism. And after um, ChatGPT was introduced in November, a lot of the journalists on, on CNET started using ChatGPT and they got in a lot of trouble for it because it wasn't authentic. Yeah. Okay. All right, next up, uh, Manas. Hey, Manas, how are you? Uh, wrote, a good morning, my dear mentor, Chris, please. Hope all is well, likewise. Uh, what a wonderful day as always. And by the way, do you think LinkedIn should introduce 30-second reels now because it's not launched anything new in years? Yeah. So when one company buys another, innovation tends to die. And so since Microsoft bought LinkedIn back in the summer of 2016, they really haven't done anything innovative or, or new. It was a brilliant acquisition in hindsight because it makes Outlook relevant longer term. Um, but I... Um, I, I, the problem with, with LinkedIn, uh, aside from innovation, is that if, if you go to the, the landing page of anybody on LinkedIn, they deployed that new feature of allowing you to do video reels to introduce yourself. And nobody is using it, right? It's, it's not that intuitive to use either kind of like uploading a video on YouTube is much more intuitive. Yeah. So, it, but if you're going to put videos on LinkedIn, what I recommend doing is upload them natively. Don't just provide a link to YouTube because what happens is these social media platforms will penalize you for driving traffic away. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, uh, next up, uh, Manas wrote, uh, can we use AI to use LinkedIn to its fullest potential and how to do that easily? And will that be beneficial uh, longer term? Yeah, well, there, there's a couple of products that, that I talk about uh, in, in this course coming out uh, called the Complete Artificial Intelligence Course. One of them is helping you to write articles without getting caught. They help you in bullet point format and then you pretty it up. But look for my course because we talk about that tool in a lot of detail. Yeah. All right. All right, next up, we have Renbeer from Mauritius. Uh, how are you doing? Great to see you, Renbeer. And Renbeer actually uh, got a big new customer. Uh, and business partner because he recently went uh, to a, a shareholder meeting. And anybody can go to shareholder meetings and that's how you meet CEOs. You go right up to them at the end of the meeting, you talk to them, you introduce yourself and you ask for a meeting with them or somebody in their company. And they're not gonna say no and they are gonna give you the time of day because they don't wanna leave before all their shareholders in the audience leaves and they wanna set a good example for other C-level executives that are also there. Yeah, good to see you at Renbeer. Okay, uh, and then Renbeer wrote, I'm not allowed to trade options since I'm not 21 yet. Oh, interesting, I've, I've never heard of that, that rule, fascinating. Um, uh, and you wrote, what I'm allowed to do though is covered calls. I was wondering how do institutions make money uh, with, with covered calls? Yeah, if you're gonna do options, and please be careful with this, uh, I don't recommend doing that. I recommend only buying calls or puts. And in the MBA program that you're a, a member of, if you go to semester four, class four in the finance track, that's FA44, finance and accounting semester four, class four, there's a 30 hour elective on options. And options can be used as insurance to protect yourself. So if I own Coca-Cola stock, ticker KO, and if I don't wanna sell it, cause I don't wanna pay taxes or for whatever reason, what I can do is I can buy an insurance product called a put. And if Coke goes down, this will go up. 
and the most I can lose is this much. Once you start selling options, though, I mean the other side of that trade, not buying them, but selling them, your losses can literally be infinite. Yeah. So just be careful with that, please. Okay. And institutions make a lot of money with covered calls and, and hedge funds make money with options because they sell them, right? They're sophisticated, way more sophisticated than me. They've done a lot of work on options over the years. Uh, and most people that buy options get ripped off because they don't really do the research on understanding how an option is priced. Yeah. All right, next up, I have got uh, Manas here who wrote, what advice do you have for a 20 year old Chris uh, who is full of energy because he's drinking lots of Pepsi Nitro I gotta have some more. Oh my God, it's good. Uh, who is full of energy, but a little confused or maybe sometimes lost. What should he do? How and why? Yeah, well, that's exactly how I was. I was full of energy, but I was lost. I was chasing careers to try to, I don't know, maybe impress my friends, whatever. But I wasn't doing what I was passionate about. And so for me, my happiest day was always day one. And then it went downhill. My happiest day, you know, at Goldman Sachs was day one. Then I went downhill. Then I wasn't making enough money, I thought, so I went to a hedge fund. My happiest day at Citadel, big hedge fund, was day one. Then I went downhill. Then I wasn't happy because hedge fund investing short term. So I went to the venture capital industry. My happiest day was day one. And I thought I was clinically depressed. But the issue with me, and with many of my students too, is as Mark Twain said, you know, the two most important days are number one, the day you're born, and number two, the day you find out why. You have to do what you were meant to do on this planet. You need to find your purpose, your passion, your raison d'etre. And for me, it was teaching, and I've never been happier. So what I recommend that you do is you think about this. If I told you that you have 30 days off, and in these 30 days, you cannot travel, you cannot work, you cannot go to school, what are you going to do with your time? Whatever that is, that is your passion and your purpose and your raison d'etre. And I think you need to run after that and make that a career. You know, as Confucius said, find an occupation you enjoy and you'll never work a day for the rest of your life. And if you're not sure what the right career is yet for you to take, to, you to have, you can take my MBA program because in my MBA program, I feel like I'm a waiter. So when you go to a restaurant, this is where I propose to my wife. When you go to a restaurant, you see all the items on the menu, but you only choose one or two things to eat. So that's my purpose, my job, my role, my raison d'etre in life, is to expose you to tons of different careers and then let you decide. Do you enjoy finance or accounting or marketing or whatever it is? And let you decide. And another way to help you decide is you can start listening to audible books from your business icons. You know, listen to books that were that are read by Sir Richard Branson, his autobiographies. And if you like what he talks about and you're inspired, then maybe choose a career commensurate with what he does. You can also read biographies on, on Elon Musk, you know, Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, Oprah Winfrey, etc. And what this does is two things. Number one, it introduces you to different job roles you might be passionate about. And number two, more importantly, these incredible entrepreneurs, because they're successful, they put their cards on the table and they give you a blueprint for why they're successful and why reinvent the wheel, use their best practices. Okay. Okay, next question from Renbeer is, are retails allowed to trade commodity futures? Uh, if yes, what advice uh, would you give me? Yeah, retail investors. So you're in, you're in Mauritius and you mentioned that you have to be 21 to, in order to buy or go long calls. Uh, so I don't know what the rules uh, are there. Um, yeah, any, anybody can trade futures. Anybody can do it. Uh, and if you want, um, in my MBA degree program, go to the options curriculum uh, or do a search on futures. And I explain that in a lot of detail. Yeah. I don't recommend doing it though. Okay. All right, give me one second, guys, to find out where I was here. YouTube jumps on me sometimes. All right, next up, uh, Manas wrote, uh, thank you for everything, my, my mentor. Thank you. I thought of you yesterday. I went out to, to lunch with Christina uh, Hong and her husband, uh, and I had dosa, which is the best food ever. I know you're from India. We talked about dosa before. Uh, you wrote, uh, God bless you forever and ever. God bless you more, brother, and thank you for those emojis. 
And you wrote, I hope Andrew is doing awesome at Berkeley and hope your cats are having bigger nails than ever. <laughs> uh, see you next week uh, with love. Uh, and thank you again for the emojis. My cats are starting to fight though. It worries me. Yeah. Okay, next up, uh, Saeed. Hey, Saeed. First time seeing you on the call. Welcome. I hope you join us again. Saeed wrote, uh, hey, Chris, thank you for the amazing content you're providing. My pleasure. Thank you for being here. Uh, and then you wrote, I have a question regarding uh, which one you prefer to use, an iPhone or an Android and why, um, uh, as well as for, for uh, laptops. Yeah. So so for me, I, I like the iPhone only because I'm, I'm in the... I'm in the Halo system with respect to using Apple products. All my products are Apple. They're just easier to use. Yeah. Um, that, that's why I use Apple and not Android. Um, now with laptops, um, I, I use Apple as well because I love the Apple ecosystem, except for my, uh, uh, my Area 51 uh, laptop, uh, which is uh, Windows-based. It's Alienware, alien, uh, uh, alienware uh, app, uh, a software that I use to, or, or laptop to play video games. I, I love it. Too early, man. I can't think so. I got more of this. All right. Oh, it's so good. Okay. And I don't drink. I don't smoke. So this is my advice, I guess. I don't drink any more, but I don't drink any less. Okay. Movid wrote, uh, hey, Chris. Uh, lots of people say finance degree is the best for the finance industry. But Larry Fink, um, uh, who's uh, the BlackRock uh, CEO, and Bill Ackman, who's a hedge fund investor, uh, say they don't have finance degrees. Please explain it. Yeah, you. Don't, it, I don't really know that many people that work on Wall Street that have a finance degree. You know, a lot of people have MBAs. So for me, for example, uh, I have an MBA in finance. I majored in finance when I went to uh, to Columbia University eight, eight million years ago. Yeah, but you don't have to have an advanced degree to get a job on Wall Street. You just have to know how to network. And had I know now, know now what I had I known back when I was younger about networking like I do now, I probably would not have gone and gotten an MBA. I would have networked like crazy. And anybody can network to get a job uh, or anything you want. And I have a free book on that if you want. Just go to my website, which is harunmba.com. And if you scroll down to the bottom, you can download my networking book for free. It's called Networking to Get Customers a Job or Anything You Want. And so for anybody thinking about uh, going to MBA school, um, I want to save you money by telling you, um, set up 100 informational meetings to see if you can make that career change. And if that doesn't work, then do an MBA. And an MBA from a traditional school costs, you know, costs like $100,000. So think about each one of those 100 meetings you're setting up as saving you $1,000. And if you set up all 100 meetings and you still can't change careers and consider getting a traditional MBA if you want. Yeah. Okay. Next question is, what do you think about fast growing startups uh, in China? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm not on top of that. Um, I, I used to invest in China years ago, uh, but I decided not to just because I did get burned on, on accounting. Um, that's just me though. Yeah. And that's not a stereotypical comment on, on anybody in China. It's just, I got burnt, so I, I don't do that. Okay. Um, next up, uh, Chibi K wrote, uh, Hey boss, good morning. How are you? Chris, please. Uh, I have a question about day trading. Yeah. Don't hedge funds and investment banks have day traders? And doesn't Renaissance algorithms trade off of technicals like day traders? Yeah. Please be careful with, with, with trading. Um, do not make it your career. I promise you will end badly. And I say this with love my heart. You can't make money day trading because each month has 20 weekdays, meaning 20 days that the markets are open. And the likelihood of you making money every month is very, very low because stocks go up and down in a short amount of time uh, for random reasons. And there's a great book by Nicholas Taleb called Fooled by Randomness. I recommend reading. So stocks might go <clears throat> might go up because of <clears throat> a peace accord between two major economies, or stocks might go down because a company in the sector that you invested in has bad earnings. You can't make money short term. You got to be very long term focused. Very long term focused. Now, in hedge fund, the hedge funds actually do the best. Are long term focused. So there, there's this brilliant man named Julian Robertson. He started a hedge fund called Tiger back in the '80s. And I had a lot of friends that worked for him. And a lot of people that worked at Tiger quit to start their own hedge funds. And they're called Tiger Cubs. 
you know, firms like Maverick, Blue Ridge, etc. And these firms, just like Tiger, a great hedge fund, are long-term focused to the extent that they make three-year bets. It works. I promise you, you have to be longer term focused. The best hedge funds are more longer term focused in terms of investment bankers, investment banks having day traders. Uh, yeah, there are position traders on trading floors at places like Goldman Sachs, UBS, etc. Uh, that will trade a particular sector like energy, etc. Um, they don't make a killing. They make a little bit of money, uh, but they've got access to tons of information on the trading floor in front of them. Now, in terms of Renaissance, uh, you wrote uh, Renaissance trades off technicals uh, like, 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 like traders do. So Renaissance is an amazing story. So Renaissance is uh, a tech-based uh, AI hedge fund uh, founded by this guy named Jim Simmons, who used to work for the NSA. And since the 1980s, Renaissance average gross annual return is over 60%. And the way that his firm does that is they have thousands of Linux servers running in parallel. And what these servers do is they pick stocks. Now, nobody's been able to figure it out like, like he has. He's a brilliant mathematician. But these algorithms, and the interesting thing is they don't really hire people that have a background in finance. They like mathematicians. And so what these algorithms might do is, for example, if it's raining a lot, right? One of the inputs might be weather patterns. If it's raining a lot, then they might go short restaurant stocks. Because when it rains a lot, people don't go out to eat and vice versa. So they're kind of an exception to the rule. But they've been using AI brilliantly for decades now. Okay. Um, if you are going to use technical analysis, please. And I'm going I'm to get down my knees on, on this one because I, I really do care about you guys. Look at, I'm begging you. Use fundamental research first, then valuation-based then technical analysis, a distant third. And use technical analysis to help you understand, you know, when to back up the truck and buy shares in a stock that might be oversold, meaning an RSI of 20. Or use technical analysis to help you understand if a stock is breaking out, uh, meaning a golden cross uh, above the 15200 200 moving average. Or use technical analysis to understand if a stock is in, a, in, a, in an upward channel. Or use technical analysis to sell some of uh, some uh, some of your your shares if a stock is overbought, but use fundamentals first, valuation second, and a distant third technical analysis, please. And I say all this because I I do care. Yeah, and I have had a lot of a lot of students that have lost money uh, day trading. It doesn't work. Okay. All right. Next up, uh, Muhammad uh, wrote. Uh, my question uh, is. I'm, a, I'm an electrical engineer working in technical sites for 20 years. Then I worked as a project manager for a couple of years. I need to know uh, which is most required field for AI um, uh, and then MBA. Yeah. So I, I don't think you need to go to school to learn about AI. I and mean, there's plenty of online courses you can take. Um, and, you know, I'm going to be issuing one of my courses, the complete AI course uh, coming out in a couple of months. You'll be able to purchase that. Or if you're in my MBA program, you can find out this link here below to, to go to it. You'll get it for free. Yeah. Or just do YouTube tutorials. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, next question is, uh, what do you think about the Chinese trading strategies and, and tactics. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I, I don't really have a, a strong opinion on that. Yeah. But one thing I am a big, I am in favor of is globalization. You know, if, if we're all connected, then people won't want to rock the boat from a geopolitical perspective. Yeah. And it does worry me with respect to seeing the same reports you all see about um, potential Chinese operations in Cuba. Yeah. Globalization is the only answer for us to get along. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Will, how are you, man? Ralph, good, good to see you. Okay. Uh, now, Movid wrote here, uh, lots of uh, lots of youngsters uh, come to private equity and hedge funds and investment banking become a millionaire very fast. Please explain this issue. It is an issue. Um, if, if, you make, if you make money, you're God. You'll never be happy. You know, you can't serve two masters, you know, and, and one of the Ten Commandments is not to have any false gods. And the Ten Commandments is the basis for many laws in many countries and many wonderful religions. And I promise you, if your only goal in life is to accumulate as much wealth as possible, you'll never be happy. 
And now I know a lot of billionaires and billionaires kids as well that I went to school with at, at Columbia. And for the most part, they're not happy. If you make money, you're God, you'll never be happy. And a lot of people that go into investment wanking, banking, so sorry, um, uh, out of undergrad or want to go into that sector, um, I tell them, if you're going to do it, use it as a stepping stone only. Uh, don't make a career out of it because you'll work insane hours. Your health will deteriorate. Uh, maybe you'll have a little bit more wealth, but you know what? You're making the same amount dollar per hour that your buddies are and that your, and your buddies are not working at banking. And they're more well-rounded. Yeah. But, and, and if you're confused about what to do in life, I recommend getting an origination job initially. What that means is this. You create the product. And if you hate creating the product, that's okay because you know how to make it. Now you can sell it or work in operations. I'll give you three examples. So one example is investment banking. So in, in investment banking, it's, it's an origination job because you originate, you take companies public, right? This is Meta's uh, 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 face. Uh, uh, prospectus. So you you take companies public. You, you it's kind of like R and D. You know, birthing a company. And if you hate it, that's okay. You understand how to take a public now, so you can move on to work in, in sales in the finance industry or another operations related job. So that's one of three examples of origination. Another example is engineering. Go into if you if you think you're interested in tech, go into engineering. And if you love programming, great. That's your career. But if you hate it, that's okay, because that's an origination job. You're creating the product. And if you hate creating the product, that's cool, because now you know how to make it. You can move on to sell it or work in operations on it or start a company based on this. And the third and final origination example is consulting. So a, a lot of people are confused in terms of what to do to start when they're starting their careers. And I was too. I still am. So I went into consulting. I went to work at Accenture. And if you work in consulting at a consulting firm like uh, Accenture or McKinsey, et cetera, you're creating you know, the corporate strategy for a company and, and deploying new solutions. And if you hate that job, creating the corporate strategy, et cetera, that's okay because that's an origination job. You originated that product. If you hate originating the product, you can move on to sell the product, do operations on the product, et cetera. So the bottom line is if you're confused in terms of what to do, get uh, an origination job. Yeah. Okay. Bakari, how are you? Good to see you. I hope you're doing well as well. Bakari's one of my, my, my MBA students. Uh, he's six foot 11. Uh, he's based in France. He plays professional basketball and he got a full scholarship from the University of Minnesota. He played NCAA. He's a good guy too. Good to see you, man. And I hope you're still playing SimCity. Build it like I am. It's addictive. It's a great game. All right, moving on to Just Me, who wrote, um, uh, what is the best place to establish a new IT company, website-based? Is the UK a good place or is the EU better? Yeah, I, I say it doesn't matter. You know, what we learned from the pandemic is we can blur the lines of distinction between borders. You, you don't have to be in the Bay Area to start a tech company. You can be anywhere in the world. I, I think we've, we've, we've witnessed the death of distance uh, post-2020. Uh, Okay. All right. Uh, next up, Zach wrote, uh, to your point about work-life balance, is it better to pursue a demanding career after the kids' golden years, meaning after the kids are older than, than 16? Yeah. Oof. I, I would say just be balanced at all points in your life. And, and you can write a daily schedule as well. This will help you tremendously to accomplish more. And as you get older, though, I, I will say, as you get older you don't waste as much time. You know, like when I was younger, when I would read a textbook, I remember reading that the preface, the introduction, all this stuff. And then as I got older, when I would look at a book or a textbook, whatever, or I was a better student eventually, I would just go to the summary sections. And so the, the analogy here is when you get older, you're much more productive because you know how to not waste time. Yeah. But don't like... Don't tell yourself, you know, I, 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 I want to make a fortune or start a company before I have kids. Like, don't do that. Because then you're making money your God. You can be balanced and have it all. You can smell the roses along the way. So I say have kids and a family while you pursue your dreams. 
Don't you want to be happy today? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Question about mutual uh, mutual funds, I, I think. Yeah. So if you want, you can go to my YouTube channel, do a search on mutual funds. I've done tons of videos about this and why I think that mutual funds are rip off and you should buy ETFs only. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next up, uh, Saeed wrote, uh, hi, Chris. I, I feel every word you're saying in your MBA programs is very important and I feel overwhelmed to memorize everything. Can you please advise on the best way to remember uh, what you teach? Thanks. Yeah. Never memorize anything, right? And you don't, have to, there's, you don't have to do any homework after any of the classes. There's a short quiz, as you know, you can do that during class. But everything I teach is with props, right? So there's no homework. You should just remember it. So I'm teaching programming now as part of my MBA. And we're publishing in the MBA curriculum a complete Python uh, elective later this year. And when you do coding or anything I teach, just look at the props I use. And it's an easier way to understand it as well. I use props for everything. And if you meet me in real life, I'm a tiny man. Yeah. And if you find that there are some topics that I teach that you're just not remembering right away, it might be because you're not passionate about that. In that case, skip those lectures and those sections. Because my, the goal of the MBA program is to help you find your passion business-wise. Okay. Okay, and then uh, uh, Information Bomb wrote a, a couple times, how about mutual subscription? I, I don't know what that means, mutual subscription. Is that mutual funds or something else? Just please uh, rephrase the question so I can best answer it. Thank you. Okay, and then Saeed wrote about the MBA program. Is there a way to repeat the past quizzes? Every once in a while to remind myself of the most important points because I'm trying, but the system doesn't allow me to. Thank you. Yeah, the way the way that we've set up the system, you can only take quizzes once. I'm so sorry. Yeah. But everything is indexed. Like what, what you can do if you want is you can search to find where I teach a certain topic. So you go to my website, harunmba.com. And then over here, you go MBA curriculum search. And you can search on anything here and it'll take you to exactly where I, I teach it uh, in the curriculum. So if I search for beta, for example, you click here, search, and depending on which MBA you bought of mine, you'll see a bunch of tabs here. And you can click to go directly to that lecture. Yeah. And if you have additional questions about this, uh, let me know, please. Thanks. Okay. Hey, Dave, how are you? All right, moving on to the pit who wrote, will AI destroy capitalism? I mean, do we all need to work uh, as a plumber, house builder, etc.? as most white collar jobs will be gone. No, no. So with the industrial revolution hundreds of years ago and with the creation of robotics for auto manufacturing back in the 80s, in those two periods of times, people were really worried that robots or the industrial revolution would replace their jobs. It didn't happen. People just retrained. It's just what they did. You know, at one point, 95% of the economy was agriculture based. And then people started using tractors and now only a couple percent of the population works in agriculture. We always retrain, we always reinvent ourselves. And the great thing about AI is that AI can actually help us to focus more on innovation because AI is supposed to replace mundane jobs. So instead of focusing on operations and repetitive tasks, we can focus on innovating. Now, as Warren Buffett said, you know, once you open AI's Pandora's box, there's no going back. And we, we got to be really, really careful uh, from an ethics perspective as well. And so I think what's going to happen is all economies, all countries and big companies are going to have their own department of AI ethics to keep AI in check. Yeah, we have to be careful. And I am so blown away by what ChatGPT has done since it was released last November that what I decided to do was cancel the rest of the gold, the new gold and platinum classes this year and work 24 seven on making tech content about this for all of you guys to be added to the MBA program. It is revolutionary, yeah. Um, now, when the internet was first commercially released, commercially in 94, 95, that is just a prophetic or, or important uh, instance uh, from a commerce perspective uh, as AI is. So I'm going all in on adding this to my, my curriculum. All right, uh, next up, uh, Denver wrote, uh, please can I get your opinion on this? Um, sure. Speed to market is crucial for products we have. Do I launch 
and then get seed funding? Or do I get seed funding and then launch? Yeah. So Salvador Dali, a great artist, once said, if you strive for perfection, you'll never reach it. And so there's this concept of an MVP, which stands for minimum viable product. Get your product out to market as soon as you can. It doesn't have to be perfect. And Reid Hoffman, who's the brilliant co-founder of, of LinkedIn, said, if you release your product when it's ready, then you've missed the market. So there's nothing wrong with releasing a product when it's not 100% ready. You can add more features later. Yeah. Uh, in terms of, of, do you need to get seed funding to create the product? So you can if you want to, but you can create a wireframe version of the product if it's an app, for example, um, and then just show investors and then raise capital that way. Or just create a, you know, a, a stream down version of the product uh, initially and give it away for free. And, and the best kind of products you can create uh, are platforms where you own the road and you charge the cars. So think about it from that perspective always. And LinkedIn, Apple, all these great companies, they have their own platforms. Yeah. Uh, and in my MBA program, uh, in the third semester, we have a venture capital boot camp based on my work working in venture capital and starting companies where I help you start your company as well. But I don't recommend ever starting a company without writing a thorough business plan first. And in my MBA program, I give you all the tools and templates that you need in order to be able to create um, your own due diligence uh, for a business plan, etc. I give you all, all the tools. I, said, I told you I'm a small man. I'm tiny. Yeah. But failing to plan is plan to fail. And you have to write a full business plan before launching a company. It's one of the most important decisions you'll make in your life too. And if you don't do it right, meaning start your company the right way. You know, it, it can destroy your, your health, your wealth, your relationships with your family members, etc. Your life. Okay, next up we have Pearl, who's in my MBA program. Pearl, good, good to see you. Uh, Pearl wrote, uh, hi, Chris. Thank you so much uh, for all you teach and give us. Uh, and you're an incredible person. The Haroon MBA is pure gold. I can't believe I'm 98% done. Nicely done. Nicely done. Uh, God bless you for that. I appreciate that. One thing I want to mention is a lot of people take my MBA program and they get a little bit frustrated because it says they're 98% done. Then they come back the next day and it shows that they're 78% done. Don't look at the percent because I'm constantly adding new content. Just look at what percent of the quizzes you've completed. Yeah, thank you. Okay, next up, uh, EB94 wrote, um, is it white collar jobs or blue, blue collar jobs that will initially be impacted by AI? Is it worth it to take courses in programming at this time? Yeah, I would say regardless of white collar or blue collar job, anything that's repetitive can be helped augmented with or maybe replaced uh, with AI. And that's not a bad thing. You know, we will retrain all of us and, and focus on innovation. And I would take programming courses. Yeah, absolutely. You can take my Excel course, which is part of the MBA degree program where I teach you how to, how to program in Excel. Excel is the best place to start working on how to learning how to program because it's object oriented and everything you, everything you do Excel wise, uh, when you move a cursor around, create a chart, etc the code is created for you and it's easy to manipulate. What I would also do today is I would go to uh, Udemy and I would take a course from Angela Yu uh, on Python. Yeah, and if you want, uh, you can take courses from Angela Yu on iOS app development as well. She's wonderful, she's amazing, yeah. Okay, uh, and then Ralph wrote, uh, I would, Chris, you were just like me. I was chasing uh, careers too for the wrong reasons. Yeah, yeah. Once once you find what you're passionate about in life, you have, you you get this insanely great euphoric feeling every day in your heart. It's like it's like the first time you hold your child or any of your your your, your children. There's this incredible, and for those of you who don't have kids, I'm jealous because you're gonna unlock this insane level of euphoria when you hold your child for the first time. A level of happiness you never thought you could you could have. And when you do what you're meant to be doing in life career-wise, you have a similar feeling to that. Not as good because kids are better, obviously. But something like that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next up, Phil. Hey, Phil. How are you? And Phil was my, my first student to ever publish a, a book using one of my templates. This is another one of my students from the East Coast of Canada. We just recently published a, a book and Phil's book, it was like four or five years ago using my template um, and it was called Super Student. 
which is prophetic, had nothing to do with, 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 with teaching, but Super Student is about chess. Good to see you, man. Phil is based uh, in Cleveland, Ohio. He works at uh, Rockwell, I think, right? Or okay. So Phil wrote, uh, uh, hey, Chris, hope you're doing well. Likewise. Uh, question. I've sent out uh, many uh, in-mails to people with no response. So I generally nudge them to get an answer or, or just move on. Yeah. So make sure your in-mails are short and right to the point because less is more. And don't say why you want to meet. And there's nothing unethical about that. What you have to do is you have to say one or two things you have in common with them and keep it short as follows. Subject line. Hi. Everyone's, by the way, everybody in this call has read every email you've gotten, but you've never read every email. That's why emails work. Subject line is hi. Contents of the message are as follows. I'm going to make this up. John, hope all is well. I'm also from Cleveland and I also work at Rockwell. Please let me know if you have time for a quick coffee or a Zoom call. Thanks a lot. Your future boss. No, thanks a lot, Chris uh, or, or Phil in your case. So you want to find couple of hooks, things you have in common with them. And then when you meet with them, and this works, I promise you, I know it sounds out there, but it works. And remember, uh, business is about relationships first and product knowledge second, and your network is your net worth. But once you get to that meeting, at first you're going to chit chat about, I don't know, stuff you have in common and go to their Twitter profile to see who they follow. So you can talk about stuff that they're passionate about uh, as well. Talking about baseball has helped me so much in my career. Uh, in meetings. I've gotten jobs actually because of it. So, you know, if, if, if they're from, I don't know, if, if, if they're from Cincinnati, you maybe talk about the Cincinnati Reds and their nine game winning streak, which is the longest winning streak they've had since 1957. Um, you know, if, so if they have baseball uh, on their, uh, they follow at base, uh, baseball professionals, you can talk about that. They follow hockey players, eh? I'm Canadian. You can talk about hockey. If they follow Bollywood films, you can talk about that as well. Make sure you bond in the first 10 minutes or so of your informational meeting because you'll never get that second chance to make that first impression. That was a cheesy quote from a Head and Shoulders commercial from the 80s. I am that old. But you want to bond. And then after 10 minutes or so, they're going to say to you gently, why are we meeting? And then you can bring up why you're meeting. And if that doesn't work, let me know. And Phil, since you're a, uh, you're, you're a platinum member of my MBA program, um, today and every Thursday at 11.20 a.m. for two hours, we have a Zoom call. So join that call. And if you want, I'll go through your LinkedIn profile and, and help you out. Okay, uh, next up, we, we have Rose from the great state of Virginia. And Rose was a, a, a platinum student of mine back in 2019. Good to see you. Uh, Rose wrote, uh, do you think everything becoming subscription-based will end up hurting companies in the long run? Uh, mostly every service and every software have switched in this model. Uh, do you think it's uh, oversaturated? No, I, I think it's the right call because, you know, instead of, and, and I've done that with my business as well. So imagine if Netscript, Netflix charged hundred bucks a year. A lot of people wouldn't pay it. It's just a, it's a, it's a big price. But if they charge nine ninety nine or whatever it is they charge these days per month, you know it's 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 less of a sticker shock, uh, and you're less likely to want to cancel that account. So it makes sense. Now investors love subscription based business models because revenue visibility is incredible for them. You know you get uh, similar cash flows every single month, even if you're not growing that much. Um, but what I'll say is that it is getting more competitive. That's for sure. Like I've even noticed that consumer-based online sales of, of courses, stuff that I do, uh, has started to not grow as fast. But business subscription is growing really, really fast uh, for online courses. But it is getting more competitive. And you know, every media company has their own subscription service now. Right? I can't keep track of them. You know, you, you've got you know, Paramount, which is the best subscription service ever. You got to subscribe to Paramount and watch the, uh, the show called The Offer. It's about the Godfather's the best. But because there's so many different competing subscription alternatives, you know, it's, it's, it's tougher to grow an online business today versus, say, I don't know, five years ago or so. And what happened was during the pandemic, subscription services took off and did extraordinarily well. The tech sector did great during the pandemic. But then there was this awful hangover period that we're just starting to get over right now. Yeah. The year of your comps were tougher. Okay. Next up, we have we have Jasper, another one of my, my um, platinum students from I think it was from a year or two ago. G good to see you. Big fan of Kiss. I remember that, that the band. Great to see you. 
Okay. All right, next up, uh, uh, Chibi K wrote, uh, I got the book Fooled by Randomness. Uh, thanks, boss. You, you, you're most welcome. Yeah, that, that's written by Taleb. It's, it, it's a good book. Good read. All right, next up we have uh, uh, Caroline, who's one of my, my Silver MBA students. She's from France originally, but lives in Ontario. She's great. Uh, you wrote, good morning, Chris. Always nice to listen to your webcast. See you at the Silver Hour, for sure. Thank you. And what Caroline's uh, referring to is in my, my Silver MBA program, you can learn more about it here. Uh, every single Thursday at 10 a.m., I do a one-hour Zoom call with just my, my Silver students. Yeah. Okay, uh, Jasper wrote, uh, hey, Chris. I've been working hard on expanding the e-commerce business, taking it seriously now, expanding my, my market to all of Europe. Awesome. Awesome. It's, it's, it's great to hear. And I remember you started a couple of companies, one of them being a Pokemon trading card business as well. Yeah. Uh, and then you wrote, let's see how far I can take it. Absolutely. And if you want during the gold uh, and, and platinum two hour office hours call uh, today at, at 1120, um, I can talk to you about your business plan in a lot more detail or just ask me questions here. Yeah. Remember the network. Yeah. And Jasper, actually, he got this great job uh, in engineering. Uh, I think it was an internship a, a year or two ago when you were taking my MBA program. And what he did was he gave the company his resume. And on the other side of the resume was a one page write up template, uh, like kind of like the things I teach in my program. Uh, that would help the company improve their operations. And it helped them get a job. But it was so good that during that meeting, they said, did you really make this? Yeah, of course you did. Okay, next up, uh, Pitt wrote, I'm a 40-year-old programmer in, in Germany. How are you? Guten Morgen, or Guten Abend. Uh, you wrote, uh, I have a high school degree, college dropout. You're in good company. That's Bill Gates dropped out, so did Zuckerberg, so did um, uh, Steve Jobs. You wrote, first baby on the way, congratulations. That's awesome. Remember, the first time you hold your child, you'll unlock a level of happiness you never thought you could have. I'm, I'm happy for you. You wrote, I'm a bit lost though. After 17 years, I don't like programming anymore. I think I got ADHD too. Uh, what career uh, can I do? Yeah, 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 sorry, sorry to hear that. Um, and I started teaching in my 40s, so I'm, I'm similar to you. Um, I, I would use the same methodology I talked about earlier today. Uh, which is if I tell you you have 30 days off and you can't travel and you can't go to work and you can't go to school, what are you going to do with your time? And maybe think about that, making that a career. And you can always take other online courses about other tools to use. Like you don't have to be a program. You can use various software packages. Um, I recommend taking courses on AI if you want to as well. Um, and then maybe take, take courses on using software packages that are not programming based, maybe more object oriented dragging and dropping based. It's more visual. Maybe you like front-end design more so than back-end design. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe it's it's you have a lot going on in your life right now. Make sure you take off at least one day a week. Um, you know, it's it's the basis of many great religions is to take, you know, Friday or Saturday or Sunday off. Maybe you're burned out. Maybe take time off. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, next up, uh, Creative Lightbox wrote, uh, Hey, Chris, how will the adoption of cryptocurrencies likely evolve in the coming years? And what implications will this have for investors and the broader financial industry? Yeah. So I think what's coming is regulation. Um, you know, state the obvious. Whenever there's a massive financial crisis like we had with FTX last year, whenever there's a financial crisis, what comes within a year or two after the crisis is over is new regulation. You know, it happened with a with the stock market crash in 1929. A couple of years later, in 1933, the SEC was created. You know, uh, in, in 2008, when we were within 24 hours of bank machines not working, uh, new regulations came out uh, to help the system be more ethical or equitable, I should say. And the same thing with, with cryptocurrencies. We had a major crisis last year. A lot of people lost a lot of money, including my students. And so what's going to happen is the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, I think, is going to regulate cryptocurrencies kind of like they do with stocks to the extent that before you issue a cryptocurrency, you have to release something like this, an investment offering memorandum, which is only fair. And there's a, the Southern District Court in, in New York State um, has been suing Ripple for, for quite a while now, uh, trying to penalize them for raising a billion dollars without filing an investment offering memorandum. And I think Ripple's going to lose that lawsuit, which will set a precedent for regulation by the SEC of cryptocurrencies. 
And that's a good thing, I think. Overregulation is bad, but a little bit is good to protect consumers. That's where I think the market is going. From a geopolitical perspective, um, the more left-wing a country is, I mean the more socialist, the more likely it is they're going to make cryptos illegal because cryptocurrencies are, are the biggest threat to national security. Because if you, if you use cryptos and not your own fiat currency, then the country can't issue bonds to change interest rates. And countries can't also issue bonds to raise money to protect the country or build bridges, walls, etc. The more right-wing a country is, like the United States, um, more capitalist, I should say, uh, the less likely it is that they're going to make cryptos illegal, but they will regulate them. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, ne next question uh, from Chibike is, uh, what is open interest uh, in options? Yeah, that's just the, uh, the, the number of options that exist right now. Kind of like when you... When you do due diligence on a company, you look at the number of shares they have. That's basically what it means. And open interest is important to, to, to look at because options have a limited life. Like stocks can stay around forever. Like Coca-Cola has been around for over 100 years. Uh, but Coca-Cola puts options. Um, they, they expire after a while. That's why you look at open interest. Yeah. Number of contracts that exist. Okay. Okay, next up, uh, Ralph uh, wrote, uh, hey, Chris, I'm behind in the MBA program trying to catch up. Uh, uh, yeah, and, and you've got the rest of your life to do it. Like what, once you sign up for my MBA program, you can go to this website to learn more. You have access forever. So there's no rush. This is your MBA and your terms. And you'll never pay another penny for me again because I add tons of new content every single year. Yeah, and I'm gonna be adding this, this AI stuff pretty soon as well, which you'll get for free. I'm using a straw because my, my teeth were not as white as they used to be. Yeah. It's my coffee. Okay. Uh, uh, next up, uh, Myrna wrote, uh, Hey, Chris, where can I find new business ideas to, to create a startup? Yeah. So there's this brilliant man um, named Mark Andrews, and I, I've met him a number of times. We were on the the board of a company as well um, together years ago. Same board, same company. Uh, so he started a company called Andreessen Horowitz, which is one of the best venture capital firms in the world. And Mark always talks about software is eating the world. And he talks about different industries that have yet to be disintermediated or disrupted uh, by software. So what I recommend you do is follow Mark Andreessen on Twitter just to get ideas from him if you want. You can also go to his website, which is a16z.com, a16z.com. And the reason it's a16z.com is because in between letter A and Z, or Z as we say in Canada, for Andreessen Horowitz, is 16 letters. Follow him. And also, you, you, can write, you can write a business plan once you come up with a good idea. And do not spend a penny on your company until you've written a thorough business plan. And that's what my, my MBA program teaches too. Uh, and then Darius wrote, uh, thank you, you're most welcome. Okay, uh, next up, uh, Jennifer. Hey, Jennifer, how are you? First time I've seen you on the call. I hope, hope you join us again. Jennifer wrote, uh, hey, Chris, uh, please, do you have a mentorship program? Uh, am I able to get mentorship with you or do I have to take the MBA program before I can get uh, mentorship with you? Yeah, so if you take my, my any of my MBA programs, like the Silver MBA, for example, um, you know, I, I, I do a one-hour Zoom uh, for my Silver students every week at 10 a.m. Uh, forever. Um, and then for my gold and platinum students, um, I do a two hour Zoom meeting starting at 1120 every Thursday. Yeah. Uh, but, but aside from that, it's, it's really, like, and I do have consulting services. You can go to this website. Um, there's, I have hourly consulting. Um, it's kind of pricey. A, a lot of corporates sign up for it, but yeah. Yeah. But Jennifer, if you want, um, send an email to support at haroonventures.com and, and I'll do 20 minutes free. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to upsell you on anything. I just want to help you. Yeah. A 20 minute zoom together. So again, email support at haroonventures.com. Yeah. Fred, how are you? It's been a while, man. Great. Great to see you. Ho hope you're doing well as well. Uh, moving on to, uh, uh, Maz who wrote, yeah, the submarine has one hour of oxygen left. The Titanic submarine. God bless them. It's heartbreaking. Yeah. And the Canadian, the Coast Guard in Canada is getting involved too. They said it's a logistics nightmare. So sad. Okay. Uh, moving on to, to Phil, who wrote, uh, for my startup company, 
Um, uh, and you know what I'm going to do actually is I'm going to open up Zoom, and if anybody wants to do Zoom, uh, we, we we can do so, uh, and I'll continue to answer your, your questions here. All right, so let me go here. So so the way to join Zoom, uh, if you want to talk to me now over Zoom or, or network with with other classmates, is you go to the following websites, all lowercase slash zoom all lowercase zoom okay and once you're here you you click this link here okay and then uh you open up zoom uh, and i'll accept you um if you guys want and, and i'll come back and check on this in, in a couple of minutes yeah all right okay next up i have got here yeah, so Phil wrote, uh, for my startup company, uh, I wanted to get uh, uh, near like-minded people uh, for energy and ideas, uh, like were they in Silicon Valley? I was thinking of moving because Ohio is not a, is not a hot place for tech. Uh, is that wise? I, I, I wouldn't move. You don't have to be in Silicon Valley to start a company. In fact, the cost of labor here is ridiculously expensive. I don't have any employees here. Yeah. Um, you, you don't need to move here at all. No. Um, if you want, what you can do, though, is you can network in Ohio. And I'm going to show everybody here uh, how to network. So give me, give me one second and attend any meeting you want to on any topic. So let's go here to a, a website called... Let's go here to a website called Meetup, okay? So let's say you're in Ohio, right? So what you can do is I guess I'll type Ohio here. And let's say you want to find somebody that's an app developer. I don't know, iOS developer in Ohio. Ohio City? I don't even know. I'm just gonna type any zip code, 90210. Yes, I watched that show 8 million years ago. Right, so what, what you can do is you can attend these, uh, these meetings in person. Okay, and this is Southern California, not the Bay Area. You can just enter in whatever your zip code is there, dude, uh, in Ohio. And you can enter in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, whatever, anything you want. And you can attend events in person or you can attend them online. Any kind of event you can think of and you can network that way. Or what you can do is um, you, can, you can leverage LinkedIn and meet with people that are developers, have something in common with you. Maybe they work for Rockwell, where you work right now, I think, uh, et cetera. Yeah. And if that didn't answer your, your question uh, correctly, uh, 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 please, please let me know, and thank you as always. Okay. Okay, and then Myrna wrote, uh, who's one of my, my, my gold students, I think, yeah, uh, wrote, uh, hey, Chris, I'm taking uh, Udemy classes with Angela Yu. Thank you for the, the suggestion. You're most welcome. She's amazing. She's incredible, man. I, I met her in Berlin a couple of years ago, 2019, at a Udemy event. She's the real deal. She's the best teacher on the internet, hands down. Yeah. All right, next up, uh, Larry wrote, what is the best way to sell eBooks securely online? without people being able to download it freely, for example, um, through a blog. Yeah, it's it's tough. Um, people will always find a way. Um, I've had it happen with, with my courses, my books, et cetera. Uh, what, what's important though is is that you, 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 you copyright the content. So you can go to copyright.gov and copyright your, your book. And I've copyrighted all of my stuff as well. And sometimes people will resell my courses online, pretend to be me, and I'll send just a cease and desist uh, email. Yeah. But people will find a way. Yeah. Un unfortunate. Yeah. You can, if you want, what you can do is, when I used to work on Wall Street, um, whenever I would download a PDF from an investment bank, um, it would have my name watermarked on it. Um, so you might be able to invest in watermark-based software um, from Adobe, for example, that might help you with your PDFs. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 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 ne next up, uh, Frenchie wrote, uh, hey, hey Frenchie, how are you? Uh, Frenchie wrote, uh, hey Chris, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, my sensei, thank, thank you. It's always great to see you. Uh, what is your view uh, with a FedNow digital currency launch? Uh, there, is, uh, there is nowhere for us to hide. Yeah. 
I don't think that the United States government um, is going to take a big risk w with a cryptocurrency anytime soon. Um, so monopolies are inherently lazy and they don't really have to innovate, right? So when Microsoft was a true monopoly back in the 90s, they didn't really innovate at all. And you know, if, if you look at the US dollar today, it looks exactly like it looked back in the 1930s. Yeah. They might make it a little bit more secure, um, you know, but I, I just don't see why they would replace uh, the fiat-based currency with anything digital uh, in the near term. Um, now, the, the Department of Treasury has been working with MIT on a white paper on trying to explore how to implement some kind of a digital currency. But if you think about it, I mean, currency, it kind of is digital. I can't remember the last time it was that I held cash, but I don't think they're going to rock the boat too much. Yeah, yeah. And the United States dollar is still the world's reserve currency. It is what it is. And, you know, there's a lot of talk that, that you know, China partnering with, with Russia and Saudi Arabia and South Africa uh, might be able to just use the, the yuan to transact in oil uh, and, and, and other commodities. But we'll know for sure that the U.S. dollar is not uh, the lowest risk investment in the world when investment bankers or investors globally, when they start creating uh, financial analysis models and using DCF, when they start discounting with a risk-free rate with the yuan and not the dollar. Yeah, I, I still believe the very last company on the planet, so to speak, to go bankrupt would be the U.S. government. That's as it stands right now. Yeah. Okay, uh, next up, uh, Patricia wrote, uh, hi, Chris. Hey, uh, will the AI information be free uh, for silver membership in your program? Yeah, absolutely. Any new content I create is free for all my MBA students. Yeah, yeah. and I'm not launching another gold or platinum program until next year. Uh, but silver, if you bought silver or you will buy silver, you're going to get everything I make for free. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, ne next up, uh, Ralph wrote, uh, hey, Chris, how do you keep control of your company like Mark Zuckerberg after you raise money uh, from investors? Yeah, it's very hard. So Zuckerberg um, has controlling interest in his company only because everybody wanted to invest in Facebook. Right? And so back in 2008, when we were within 24 hours of bank machines not working, venture capitalists didn't want to invest in risky startups. So they all threw their money uh, into Facebook. So Facebook was lucky. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of skill involved, but lucky uh, that they were you know, the, the lowest risk investment. Same thing with, with, uh, Ute, uh, with Google in 2001 after 9-11. After Nobody wanted to put money in venture capital. Um, and the lowest risk company at that point in time was was. was Google, which helped them before their 2004 IPO. Yeah. Uh, so Zuck was kind of, it was a one-off. It's hard to do that. Now, for, for most people, if you if you start a company today and then you take it public, by the time it goes public, you're probably going to own less than 10 or 15% of the company, right? And, and it sucks, but you're worth a hell of a lot more, even though you own a, a lower percent of the company. And what, what's important is to make sure that you select the right board members. So whenever somebody invests a lot of company, a lot of money in your company when it's private, they get a board seat or they can't because they have a fiduciary duty or fiscal responsibility to their investors to explain how the investment's going. So a bad board member is worse than a bad marriage because with, with, with a bad marriage, I mean, you're, you, it's unfortunate, but you, you get divorced. A bad board member is a thorn in your side and they don't go away. So you have to be really, really careful when selecting uh, board members. Uh, interview them as well. Just be careful. Yeah. But the more money you raise, the, l the lower the percent of the company you're going to own. But that's okay because you're worth a lot more per share, so to speak. Yeah. Okay. All right. Next up, Viro uh, uh, Jradi uh, wrote... Um, and if I mispronounce your name, uh, please let, let me know. Looks like you have a number in your, your name there as well. Um, wrote, you wrote, hi, Chris. Hey, how can I know uh, the weaknesses of the management team and the CEO of a company like NVIDIA uh, when I'm doing investment research? Yeah. So w what I usually say is if, if the founder is still running the company, then that's a good thing. I wrote this article in VentureBeat years ago. VentureBeat.com. You can search for it when I worked in VC. And the title of the article was uh, when 
Founders of a management team resign. Investors should run for the exit. So I usually only like to invest in companies where the founder is still there. So that, that, that's what I would say. In, in terms of, of looking at the broader management team, you can, you can go to the 10K for ticker NVDA for NVIDIA, for example. Go to the 10K and you can read up a profile on all the management team members. Um, you can also watch the, the CEO present. And you want to make sure they're a great salesperson. So that's what CEOs are, right? The great salespeople. That's how they became CEOs. Yeah. yeah. And then you also want to, if you can, on LinkedIn, you know, talk to friends of yours that are connected with people in that company. And we're all two degrees of separation away from everybody anyway. Yeah. You can also go to glassdoor.com. And when you're at glassdoor.com, you can enter the name of the company. And you can read reviews by employees on that manager, for example. But the worst thing you can do is meet with a CEO of a company or a manage, or, or a senior executive and then invest. You want to do your research first uh, and then meet with them if you can later. Because CEOs are the best salespeople in the world. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, and then Frenchie, I, I think you joined, uh, you're trying to join the, uh, the Zoom here. If, if you want to join, ask questions, question, go for it, please. Yeah, it'd be great to see you. I always learn from you. Okay. Um, all right. Next up, uh, Pitt wrote, uh, uh, thank you, Sensei. Chris, please, sure. Uh, I love statistics of countries. Uh, I know the GDP, capitals, population, et cetera, of all countries in the world uh, by, uh, by, <laughs> by head. Uh, what, what career is that, uh, LOL? Yeah. I, that, that sounds to me like a TikTok career. And this is going to sound out there, but one of my favorite TikTokers talks about uh, about fasting stats about countries and capitals, etc. And I just learned this. This is crazy. Brazil is so big that the north of Brazil is closer to Canada than to the south of Brazil. And Brazil is so wide that the east coast of Brazil is closer to Africa than it is to the west coast of Brazil. So these interesting tidbits like this, you can make a social media career out of that. So I challenge you, I say this with love my heart, to do this on TikTok. And once you're up and running on TikTok, let me know so I can show your videos here on my webcast. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, next up, uh, Super, Super Fox Fly wrote, hi. Hey, how are you? Um, you wrote, I, I got a grant to visit a couple of people in the world uh, I'm a surgeon by trade, and I have a background uh, in computer science. Cool, cool. Um, and then you wrote, uh, who would you recommend I could spend a week with? Who would welcome it that could have a positive impact? It could be medicine or AI or business or anything. Uh, or could I uh, come to spend a week with, with you? Uh, I'm based in, in the UK. Um, yeah, yeah. No, thank you for that. Yeah. I mean, what, what you can do is, is, is this, if, if a corporate or government or entity is going to pay for you to travel, what I would do is I would leverage LinkedIn and set up just a ton of one-on-one -on -one meetings. And I want you all to read this book uh, by Reid Hoffman, who's the co-founder of LinkedIn. The name of the book is The Startup of You. And he talks about in this book about setting up a bank account. And the purpose of this bank account is for travel to network. Right, so you'll put a bunch of money uh, in this bank account, and then every six or twelve months you'll fly somewhere and set up a bunch of meetings all day long. And it there's a massive return on investment from doing this because again, your network is your your net worth, and relationships are, are more important uh, th than product knowledge. But what I would say, uh, Super Foxfly, um, is I would think about where do you want to be career wise in ten years, and. It's, and then once you figure out where you want to be, there's a gap. How do you fill that gap? And think about the type of people you want to meet with that would help you fill that gap. And I learned this from Jeff Bezos at Amazon. So what Jeff Bezos uh, did for years uh, when he was you know, really involved with Amazon was he would have all of his product managers on, on Kindle, AWS, et cetera. He would have them, have them all write a press release today that's going to be released years into the future. And what he would do is he would look at that press release and say, okay, there's a gap. How do we fill this gap? 
He's so long-term focused. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Next up, I have, and if I miss any questions, just paste them again, please. Okay. All right. Uh, next up, uh, Niraj wrote, um, do you think that the Fed does one or two more rate hikes before year end uh, due to their aggressive monetary uh, policy stance? Yeah, it's it's working, man. It's working. Inflation is down to 4% from 8 or 9% a year ago. Unlike in, in the UK, it breaks my heart to see what's happening there. UK just raised interest rates by half a basis point, by uh, half a percent today. Um, I don't know, but a lot of people are speculating that the Federal Reserve might raise interest rates uh, by another 25 basis points this July. They have to say that though. The Fed has to posture and kind of imply, hey, we might raise rates again. Otherwise the economy will get too red hot uh, and the markets will go up a lot. And if the markets go up a lot, people will be spending a lot more, which means higher inflation. Yeah, so I don't know. You know, the probability of a recession by year end is still 50-50, according to economists. And uh, economists have successfully predicted seven of the past 86 recessions. So I, I don't know. And the definition of a recession is two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. Yeah. We don't know. And what happens, though, is, is when, when, when governments raise interest rates, it doesn't impact the economy right away. It can take up to a year, sometimes longer. So all these, uh, these rate hikes that the Federal Reserve did over the past year or so, it takes a long time for that to filter through. Yeah. But I think the Fed has done the right thing by raising interest rates. And I think when times are good, we always have to raise rates. Otherwise, when times are bad, you can't cut rates uh, to jumpstart the economy. Yeah. Okay, Hasib wrote, uh, hi, Chris, hope you're well. Good to see you. Welcome to the house of Habibi. Yeah. Okay, uh, moving on to uh, Pitt, uh, who wrote, uh, Nigeria has a goal to reach $33,000 GDP per capita in 2050. Do you think near Nigeria will be the first uh, economic power and a great uh, place for Western investors to invest because they have 200? Yeah, it's a massive economy. It's the biggest economy in, in Africa, population wise, too, by, by, by a mile. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm not I'm certainly not an expert in that area, but I do know that a lot of venture capitalists, a lot of sophisticated investors are looking at Africa as the final frontier, the best next place to invest in. Uh, and I think that the State Department in the United States is probably going to invest a lot of money in Africa. And one of the reasons I say that is not just to help economic growth, but because China uh, is investing a ton of money and they have a ton of influence uh, in Africa now. So what China does, and, and I went to Rwanda, um, you know, I, I built a school there. And by the way, I'm going to be going back to Rwanda. I'm going to do this weekly webcast from Rwanda um, uh, 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 in, in I think the last week of July. From 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 uh, uh, from the school we built, um, uh, but but when I when I when I've gone to Rwanda, I've noticed that some of the roads are, are beautifully paved. The infrastructure is great, and a lot of that is paid for by Chinese companies, and and it's a good thing because Chinese companies, you know, they'll take a lot of commodities out of Africa, and in return they'll they'll build incredible infrastructure. But what's happening is China is having a lot of influence now, policy wise, in Africa, um, and, and I think that the United States is going to probably try to have a little bit more influence as well. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, I do believe that countries like Nigeria and Africa's continent in general uh, are probably a good place to invest longer term. Also, we've witnessed the death of distance, um, you know, post this pandemic. You can start a company from anywhere. Yeah. And I have a lot of students in Nigeria too, including Adiposi, one of my favorite students ever, who told me once he said, Chris, with pain, you find your purpose. Yeah. Okay. And Pitt, thank you for those, those heart uh, uh, emojis. Thank you. Okay, moving on to Hasib, uh, who wrote, uh, Hi, Chris. Uh, hope you're well, likewise. Uh, just want to ask if you think a mathematics degree is worth it for the future, and what skills should I be learning uh, if I want a strong career in finance and business? Yeah, I would say that math is is an incredible thing to learn if you're interested in AI. Uh, and so, as I mentioned earlier in the call, uh, the best uh, uh, hedge fund in history, Renaissance, uh, has 60% gross annual average return since the 1980s. Uh, and they hire mathematicians. Yeah. But AI and math go hand in hand. Machine learning does as well. And we know that machine learning is a subset of AI. 
um, and just understanding, you know, basic linear regression, multiple regression analysis, etc., can really help you a lot in any industry that you go into. Because without data to back up an idea, uh, it's an idea and not a thesis. Yeah. And as part of this uh, this elective, I'm going to be releasing my MBA program uh, on on artificial intelligence. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm also teaching you how to use Microsoft Excel to do artificial intelligence and machine learning. Excel is powerful with its data analysis tools. And I'm going to teach it in the MBA curriculum from scratch. And I'm assuming that people do not have a background in stats. And if you do, forget everything you've learned because I'm going to teach you stats and all this stuff from scratch. It'll be fun. And as always, I'll, I'll, use, I'll use a lot of props. Yeah. Okay. All right. Next up, Larry wrote, uh, hey, Chris, once again, what are your thoughts on AI prompt uh, engineering? A huge fan. I, I love it. But just be careful of a couple things. Um, with ChatGPT, for example, ChatGPT is quite often confidently wrong. And I say confidently wrong because, you know, it provides you with answers immediately with beautiful parallel construction with no more than three sentences per paragraph. And we assume that, you know, that with competence comes confidence. You know, uh, or and vice versa. Kind of like when you, when you meet somebody who seems really confident, you're like, oh my God, they must be competent. Just be careful. Always double check the data in, in chat GPT or with any AI prompt engineering product uh, because quite often they're wrong. You got to double check it all. Always, always, always. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and in this, uh, this elective, I'm adding to the MBA degree program, uh, this artificial intelligence elective, um, I'm not just covering, Luca and I are not just covering ChatGPT, we're covering uh, BARD by Google. We're also covering uh, uh, Bing, uh, Bing Chat by Microsoft. And not the, not the intuitive stuff, we teach the more advanced stuff as well. Uh, we also teach you how to create incredible images with, with DALI uh, and tons of other applications. Yeah, there, there's so much to it. It's the most comprehensive thing I've ever done. Yeah, and Luca's a great partner. Except he's too tall. He came into my studio and I had to put myself up in a booster. I'm six feet about, he's like six foot a million. He's tall. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, next up, uh, Super Fox Fly wrote, um, how do you keep yourself at maximum productivity? Uh, I work uh, as a surgeon and at the same time, I'm working on uh, knowledge and my skills for my job. I have little time for my uh, AI research, et cetera. Yeah, so I use I use um, audio-based operating systems a lot. So in the morning when I'm getting ready, like when I was showering this morning, I did this. Alexa, what's the Wall Street Journal news? From the Wall Street Journal. Alexa, please stop. I said please because we're doing a live webcast. Otherwise, I wouldn't include please. Yeah, But I use that a lot. I, I also, um, uh, I, I listen to a lot of Audible books as well. Uh, when I'm at the gym, uh, and then what I also do, and this is this is cray cray, but that's okay. So what what I also do is I exercise all day long. I get twenty thousand steps a day uh, in this office, and I recommend that you guys consider getting something like like I have here. This is the the cheapest treadmill on the market because there's no bars on the side. Um, it's just just a treadmill, right? Um, and so what I do is I walk at six miles an hour all day long. Okay. All right, six kilometers an hour, I should say, all day long, like, like this. And it gets tricky, like you're a surgeon, so don't do this when you're operating, because you won't be steady. Yeah. <laughs> um, but what I do is I, I actually increase this as well. So this is up here when I'm looking at my other computer, and I look at my computer up there, because I'm trying to work on my posture. So I have another computer up there that, that I look at. But I do this all day long. And after a while, you don't realize that you're doing it. And so I get to multitask. I kill two birds with one stone. You know, I work on my health uh, while I'm working on content at the same time. And I, I came up with this idea because w when I was younger, when I was younger, I remember I used to get up one hour early every day to study. And that one hour of productivity in the morning was the equivalent of 10 hours at night. That's why cramming at night doesn't work. And so I thought to myself, how can I replicate that one hour and have that much attention span all day long every day? And I realized through biohacking that when you exercise 
you're feeding your mind. You're providing your mind with oxygen, etc. And what that does, it makes you feel like you just woke up. So if I do 12 hours per day of this, and I walk a bit slower sometimes, then it's the equivalent of 10x. It's 120 hours worth of productivity in one day. Try it. I promise you it works. It's revolutionary. It's a simple idea. You can get a, a cheap de a desk that goes up and down on Amazon, and you can get a, a, treat, a cheap uh, uh, treadmill as well uh, on Amazon. Yeah, do it. But not when you're surgery. Okay. If my dad's watching, he's laughing at that. My dad's a radiologist, which means he fixes radios. Right, Dada? Dada, I love you. Yeah. Okay. And mom, too, if you're watching. Okay. And when I go to get her to bed every day, I always thank God for 10 things in this order. Andrew, Matthew, Dylan, Christine, my wife, my mom, my dad, my brother, Jamie, my sisters, Katie and Elizabeth, and you, my students. 10 things. And that gets me into a peak mental state every day because I practice gratitude. I'm already in a better mood right now because I was just walking. Yeah. Let me, let me offset that with some Pepsi Nitro here. So good. All right. Uh, next up, uh, uh, Chinadu uh, wrote um, a new guy named Chinadu Ebe uh, in Canada uh, growing up. Um, I had my own charity creating websites for charities for free. Uh, and he worked at, 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 at um, YMCA. So the question is, hey, Chris, I'm a 21-year-old student and pursuing a degree in international business and finance. I heard about investment banking from a YouTuber, and I immediately started uh, following uh, your, your course. Thank you. And then he wrote, I'm really into investing, and I want to learn uh, uh, the depth of investing. Currently, I'm reading books on financials, but I feel like it's not enough. How do I build my path to becoming a professional uh, investor? Um, so I have courses you, you can take on this. And if you want, I, I have a course called the Complete Financial Analyst Course you can access here. Or take my MBA program where I teach you it in, in a lot more detail. Yeah. Um, now, it's, it's hard to find good books, uh, but I, I used to work at a big hedge fund called Citadel. And uh, the billionaire founder, Ken Griffin, I once had a, I met with him half hour when I went in his office. And whenever I'm in somebody's office who's more successful than me, which is every meeting in an office, I always look at their bookshelf to see what they're reading. And on Ken Griffin's bookshelf uh, was uh, a bunch of books by Damodorian. And so, of course, I order those books in the elevator on the way down after the meeting. And so Damodorian is a professor of finance at NYU. So you can check out his books, Damodorian. You can get his books. It might help. But some of it's a little, little bit theoretical. Um, and so what I recommend also doing is listening to audible books or reading books uh, about financial geniuses, you know, such as, as Warren Buffett, for example. Yeah. And I mentioned Buffett because he's very long-term focused. And the worst thing we can do is be short-term focused when investing. Yeah. He used to say, the longer the view, the wiser the intention. Okay. Now, if you want to be a professional investor, um, it makes sense to work, obviously, at a hedge fund. Uh, or an investment management firm. And that comes with networking, which I teach at the very beginning of my MBA degree program. Yeah, Or you can just go to my website, which I've shared before, download the networking book to get started. Okay. Give me one second here. Okay, so so next up, I have got here a Superfly Fox uh, who, who wrote, uh, I, I tend to take on too many things and my energy gets drained. Uh, that does not lead to my best work. How can I realistically time myself or set realistic goals for day to day so I don't overstretch myself? Yeah, I, I would say that it's a simple solution, uh, which is to create a, a daily schedule, as I talked about earlier. You can go to this website to download something similar to this. This is from my MBA program. It's, it's, it's more elaborate, but you can go to harunmba.com slash schedule, all lowercase, schedule. Uh, and schedule each day the day before. Because if you want to get something done, give it to a busy person. It works really well. Yeah. Don't forget to schedule in time for exercise and family and prayer too. Yeah. Practice gratitude. Even if you're not religious, just practice gratitude, man. Like before you get out of bed every day, it makes every day so much more fun. 
Okay. And retail therapy doesn't work, but gratitude does, and it's free. All right, give me one second. Yeah, and then you wrote, uh, it, it's hard to find time to do anything. Yeah, just schedule everything. It, it works, I promise you. Yeah. Okay, moving on to Pulasti, who wrote, uh, hey, Chris, how are you? Uh, I'm great, and I hope you're doing well. You wrote, um, I'm sorry I can't join the... the the, the, couldn't join the previous live stream. All, all good. All good. Okay. Uh, next up, uh, Viroxod1 wrote, uh, I'm just going to say V1. Uh, V1 wrote, uh, hi, Chris. Uh, do you think uh, it's a good time to buy a, a, a multifamily right now? And how do you see real estate? Oh, okay. In the next a few months. Yeah. Multifamily home. Yeah. Yeah. So, Nobody can call real estate in the next six months or any investment class for that matter. It, it's hard to do, right? But I, I do believe that um, the best investments you can make real estate wise are farmland or in the suburbs, anything far away from the city. The city is the worst investment you can make. I think we're gonna, there's a day of reckoning coming within a year or so in commercial real estate. You're gonna see a lot of defaults, right? The, the bond premiums in, in New York, for example, New York State, uh, in, in city-based areas uh, have gone through the roof. Um, and, and the issue is this, uh, you know, uh, the pandemic has taught us that we can all work remotely. And, and if you think about it, like cities are going to be in secular decline. Like I don't bother going to San Francisco anymore where I live um, for many reasons. I don't want to go there. You read between the lines, I think you get it though. But like, if you think about it, why would you build a city today? It, it's ridiculous. You drive an hour there, an hour back, whatever. Uh, you destroy the environment doing so. Then you get to a big office tower. Then you go to meet. It's just ridiculous. And that, that commute time is not only bad for the environment, but it's bad for your health as well. Because it takes away from time being able to spend with family, loved ones, and exercise. It doesn't make, cities don't make sense. So I, I think that cities are going to be in secular decline and are the worst investments you can possibly make. Uh, I think investing in farmland is a great investment longer term. In terms of multifamily uh, units to buy, it all depends on, 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 on the prices. Um, we, we've slowed down our purchase, my wife and I, we've slowed down our purchases of, of real estate investments recently uh, only because uh, we're a little bit worried about where the market's going because interest rates have risen. When interest rates rise, of course, what happens is uh, the price of houses goes down. Yeah, but it, it's all relative, right? You got you go to Zillow.com and look at the price of similar houses close to where you're looking at buying. It's all relative. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, next up, Durs wrote: uh, Is computer science degree worth it for AI and hedge fund industry? Thank you. Yeah, it's not. I mean, for, for a hedge fund, if you want to go and work at an AI-based hedge fund or be a quant at a hedge fund or work in risk management, it could help. It could help. But hedge funds are tough to get into, and it usually comes down to aggressive networking. And in fact, whenever you see a job opening for any company online, your chance of getting that job are literally one out of 250. Who gets that job then? Well, it's not just the person with, with a, the highest advanced degree. More importantly, it's the person that knows somebody at that company. So if these are the rules, then we have to network to meet people at companies we want to work at and set up informational meetings, which is what I teach in my MBA degree program. Yeah. Yeah. But I would say a computer science degree is obviously more relevant uh, if you want to go and work in engineering at a firm like a Google, for example. Yeah, But not the hedge funds. Okay. And... Okay. All right, next up, uh, Pitt wrote, thank you for your answers, you're most welcome. I have uh, two ServiceNow certificates. That's right, ticker NOW. I participated in the IPO. Um, uh, it, it was Fred Luddy was the founder I met with him, great guy. Uh, um, Frank was there and Mike Scarpelli as well. Um, yeah, and they all went together to go work at, um, God, what was that start? Snowflake Computing. And I almost led the Series B, I think, on Snowflake before I quit to teach. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I have two ServiceNow certificates. A, a freelance opportunity appeared. Uh, my wife is terrified, and, and so am I, of freelancing. Uh, any advice? Yeah. 
No, you shouldn't be scared of freelancing. And you, you gotta have multiple customers at the same time, right? So if you go to upwork.com and you advertise your freelance services, right? From a risk management perspective and exposure perspective, uh, as long as you're diversified and you have multiple customers at the same time, if one of them drives up, you're okay. It's actually better, I think, in some ways than having a full-time job at one company. Because if you have a full-time job at one company, your exposure is 100% to that employer. But with freelancing, you're more diversified. It's like having a diversified investment portfolio of 20 stocks versus just one. Yeah. But don't forget to brag about your accomplishments uh, when freelancing, you know, through your LinkedIn profile or create a portfolio page on, on Squarespace or, 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 or Wix or uh, WordPress, etc. Yeah. Okay. Next up, uh, Madhukar wrote, uh, hey, Chris, uh, what is your opinion on the statement U.S. taxation industry can never face a recession. Yeah. Well, the, 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 the two things in life that occur no matter what are death and taxes. So I guess that's, that's where that comes from. Yeah. Yeah. Also in the United States, uh, the, the, there's a very high inheritance tax. I think it's like 50%, something you don't see in almost any other country. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then the last question I'm going to answer today uh, is uh, from uh, Makiri who wrote, uh, hey Chris, any advice or tips for somebody starting a YouTube channel? Do you have any courses on it? If not, uh, any recommendations? Thanks. Yeah, I, I do actually, yeah. So I'll, I'll show you the course here. So if you go to this web address you see right here, uh, which is uh, learn.haroonventures.com, uh, you'll see all my courses. Yeah, so here's my, my MBA and let's see here. If we scroll down, you'll see uh, YouTube. Here it is here, yeah. So it's called the Complete YouTube Course. Uh, and I, I taught it with Sasha Stevenson, who's actually one of my students I met on the week number 10 of this, this weekly webcast. We're on week two, 234 now. She has over a million uh, YouTube subscribers. She, she's great. So yeah, we, we teach it, yeah. It's also covered in, in the MBA degree program where, where I cover everything in more detail. Okay. All right, um, but if, if you're gonna create a, a, a YouTube channel, just like the mindset's gotta be that you're never giving up on it, ever, ever. You're gonna do it to the, the day you die. Um, and I know it's extreme, but most people go in with the mindset of, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna work really hard and make a lot of money on it, um, and they give up after six months. Just be in it for the long term. Because Warren Buffett said, the longer the view, the wiser the intention. All right, guys, I'm going to wrap up today's call now. Uh, for those of you in my, my Silver MBA degree program, you can learn more by going to this link here. For those of you in my Silver MBA degree program, we have our weekly one-hour Zoom call starting um, in about 10 minutes at 10 a.m. Pacific time. Looking forward to seeing you there. Uh, for those of you in my Gold and Platinum MBA program, I'll see you at 11.20 a.m. today for our two-hour weekly call. Uh, and then Platinum students, I'm looking forward to doing one on one with you later today as, as, as well. God bless you all. Click like and subscribe and all that stuff. Uh, have a wonderful and restful weekend. Don't forget to exercise. And I'm going to end this webcast um, uh, uh, with, um, uh, with a life-changing video that I licensed uh, from Steve Jobs and particularly from the at Silicon Valley Historical Association. Um, check out this video. It is life-changing and thank you. When you grow up, you tend to get told that the world is the way it is and your, your life is just to live your life inside the world, try not to bash into the walls too much, uh, uh, try to have a nice family life, uh, have fun, save a little money. Um, but life, th that's a very limited life. Life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact, and that is everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you. And you can change it, you can influence it, you can, you can build your own things that other people can use. And the minute that you understand that you can poke life and actually something will, you know, if you push in, something will pop out the other side, that you can, you can change it, you can mold it, um, that's maybe the most important thing, is to shake off this, uh, th this, uh, erroneous notion that life is is there and you're just going to live in it versus embrace it change it 
improve it, make your mark upon it. Um, I, I think that's very important. And however you learn that, once you learn it, uh, you'll want to change life and make it better because it's kind of messed up in a lot of ways. Um, once you learn that, you'll never be the same again.